Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about quantum information, which is the name of the lecture today. Um, however, uh, I'm going to be speaking a little bit more generally uh, than, than just quantum information. I'm going to talk a little bit about atomic physics as well and, and sort of assorted topics of this, is, of this forum. Um, and, and this is going to sound a little bit of, uh, weird, like what exactly is this topic? Like this seems like a little bit niche, like what exactly does this mean? And I promise we'll get to this. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to say uh, a few things. Uh, uh, since the end of the semester is coming up, your final papers will be due pretty soon. It's, it's sometime during Dead Week, I believe. I believe it's Monday uh, of Dead Week. Yeah, it's Monday. Uh, we're going to uh, basically post some link at some point uh, on our B courses, uh, asking you guys to basically submit uh, some idea for a final uh, paper. It doesn't really need to be super finalized, but we just want to get an indication that you guys are like thinking about uh, what kind of topics you want to do. Uh, we're also going to be posting our second to last problem set today, problem set nine. Uh, and on that problem set, we hope it's not super uh, difficult. It's basically like, we're gonna have you like play with an actual uh, like sort of public access quantum computer uh, that IBM is making available. Uh, and so that's kind of fun. Uh, it's, it's a little bit unexpected uh, how, how it is, uh, how it works, but um, anyway, uh, let's start the lecture. So we're going to be talking about quantum information. As I said, what is this? Well, when you hear about things like quantum computers uh, or like uh, sort of uh, tr like, you know, quantum information processing, uh, that's basically what I mean, right? Um, so uh, I guess in order to, to uh, I guess we'll, we'll sort of talk about this a little bit more, but uh, you can sort of contrast this from like classical information processing, like, uh, like what your computer is currently doing, right? And the sense in which the uh, the sense in which that's the case, uh, we'll soon see in a few minutes. So first, uh, let's talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. Let's do a brief review. So in quantum mechanics, things can be in a superposition of states. So the classic example is Schrodinger's cat. You might have like a cat, and in in classical reality, uh, we can see the cat and we look, and it's either alive or dead. It's clearly one or the other, and it can't be both. But in quantum mechanics, in fact, it can be both. It can be in a, a superposition of dead and alive. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, and so in that sense, quantum mechanics is interesting because it gives you sort of a larger probability space uh, or a larger like, yeah, possibility space of, of, of uh, you know, things that can happen. Uh, and so uh, one, uh, a few ways to motivate why uh, uh, quantum mechanics might be very uh, useful in, in increasing the ability of our computers to do uh, uh, valid computation is that if you think about it, uh, because you can basically be in any combination of dead and alive, like your cat can be in any combination of dead and alive, that means that there's like essentially an infinite number of quantum states. Like you can be in any fraction dead and any fraction alive. That's sort of like a very heuristic way to put it. However, that's like not the full picture because as you might remember as well, uh, measuring things in quantum mechanics is actually very, very concretely important in the sense that if you measure a state, you can't like you will never measure it uh, like if you measure if you ask the question of whether it's dead or alive and you you measure answer asking that question uh, then you're you're never going to get the answer like it's in between you're always going to get one or the other and, uh, and therefore when you make that measurement you only ever get that one piece of information back out so in that sense when you make a measurement you sort of get like one bit's worth of information. Uh, but before, but you know, assuming that you leave your measurements towards the end, uh, you know, you can get sort of remarkable speed ups by by taking advantage of the fact that you can put your qubits in superposition. Uh, so I, I haven't really explained that word yet, but we'll get to that. Uh, get to that. Uh, another uh, piece of motivation is that the superposition is good for parallelization. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when you have a a, a computation which is parallelized, that means that uh, like, is there something in the background uh, that we could mute? Um, yeah, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, parallelization is essentially when you uh, have a computation that can be basically split up into a whole lot of different uh, computations all running in uh, sequence, right? Um, so uh, those sorts of problems are, are very, very useful, uh, are very, very uh, usefully solved by uh, quantum computers in principle. Uh, because if you think about it, 
if you take your system and you basically put it in quantum superposition, do your calculation, and then sort of collapse it back down, you can essentially do all those computations sort of in parallel uh, with a lot less overhead than just having to do them one after the other. And so in that sense, uh, quantum uh, computing is going to be very powerful for speeding up computations of that sort. Um, so uh, I want to sort of uh, go over uh, sort of like what classical information is. And, and it's really quite simple, I, I think. So uh, classical information you can think of as being uh, broadly described by bits. So a bit is basically like, like either a zero or a one, and it's basically the fundamental unit of information. Right? And so you might think, well, zero and one, like that doesn't give you much information. And yes, this is true. But if you have a whole lot of zeros and ones, like you have a sequence, like zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, or something, then like the more of those bits you have, the more information you have. Um, and so, for example, your computers, you might know that your computers have like n number of gigabytes or megabytes or terabytes or whatever. And uh, this is the basic idea. So a byte is actually eight bits. And so fundamentally, even though your computer is showing you all these nice pictures, uh, fundamentally what's happening behind the scenes is that there are like physical systems in your computer uh, which are uh, in one state, which is which we think of as a zero, or in another state represented by one. Um, okay. Uh, so now we take a leap to uh, what are called quantum bits, which uh, are generally called qubits. So I'm just going to call them qubits. Uh, quantum bits are basically two state quantum systems. So quantum systems which can be in two states, zero or one, but because they're quantum, they can actually be in any superposition of those states as well. So if you look on the left, you see this picture of like a one and a zero, which is a classical bit. A bit can only be a one or a zero, but a qubit can be sort of anywhere in between, actually, if you look at this picture on the left. Um, and because quantum bits can be in any superposition of zero and one, you really sort of, it turns out that um, they, they contain a, a lot of information. And for reasons that I'll describe uh, in a moment, it turns out that, in fact, uh, the number of qubits is actually sort of uh, re represents like an, or it's like it's equivalent to like an exponentially large number of classical bits. So for example, if I have n qubits, that's two to the n classical bits, roughly speaking. So if I have one qubit, that's like, um, that's like two classical bits, that's fine. Uh, however, if I have um, like, let's say uh, uh, four uh, qubits, that's actually 16 classical bits, is that right? Um, and, and it goes up exponentially there. So uh, one term uh, which I would like to introduce, which is sort of uh, extremely important uh, nowadays, uh, is, is, is a goal called quantum supremacy, which is basically the idea of, can we create a quantum computer that is better than any uh, classical computer in the sense that it can solve some problem that a classical computer cannot solve? Um, and arguably, we have done problems like that already. Uh, Google has actually made some announcement of, um, announcements about uh, problems like this. Uh, but because of this exponential dependence, it turns out quantum supremacy is super, super, uh, like the number of qubits you need uh, to make quantum supremacy a reality is actually not as many as you might think. So for example, quantum supremacy, uh, some people estimate, requires only about 50 qubits because uh, 2 to the 50 is like a very large number. It's like terabytes. Um, like many terabytes, um, and so um, and so that's sort of the broad goal of quantum computing. And so um, I haven't really been so concrete about what kind of problems you can solve with quantum computing, but here's one example. Uh, it's called RSA. It's actually it's it's kind of like a sketchy uh, problem to want to solve because if you could solve this problem, you could basically like hack into banks and like uh, you know commit a very uh, global scales of fraud. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's think about uh, sort of uh, the nature of some uh, mathematical problems that you might want to solve with a computer. So some problems are easier to do one way than the other. So for example, multiplication is easy to do one way. By easy, I don't mean like, like it doesn't take a lot of time for a person, but what I mean is like it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so for example, you learn the simple algorithm of how to multiply numbers together in uh, elementary school where you just like sort of write one number above the other and, and follow this like very concrete set of steps and your computer is quite e easily able to do that. Um, however, the other, uh, the, uh, doing something the other way is, is maybe not so simple. 
uh, so like the analogy would be division. Like if you remember how you would uh, uh, do division when you're in elementary school, you'd basically have to like, uh, like the, if you think about the steps of division, you'd have to basically guess numbers until uh, uh, like sort of your remainder was less than the number that you guessed or something like that, um, like this kind of thing. Um, there's a little bit of guesswork involved. And so uh, basically, so, uh, like, so this, is, this, is, this is a very interesting thing that some problems are uh, easy to do one way and hard to do the other way. And I guess a more concrete version of this, which is very applicable to RSA, is uh, if you know what a prime number is, it's a number that can't be sort of divided into other numbers besides one in itself. So uh, like an even number is not uh, prime because it can be divided by two. Um, so I'm going to tell you that 487 and 719, these numbers are both um, uh, prime numbers, which means you can't divide them up anymore. Um, so if I ask you the question, could you multiply 487 and 719? That's a pretty easy question, I would say, uh, because you can just put it into your calculator and, and get it out, or alternatively, you could write out all the steps. Um, however, there's another question, which is the hard question, which is, and, and the answer to this question turns out to be 350,153. But if I asked you, if I just told you that number and I didn't tell you anything else, and I said, uh, what two prime numbers multiplied to create that number? You would have a very, very hard time reversing uh, that that product because you basically have to go go through and check every number like that could be like a divisor uh, until you find the right one. And if your number is super, super, super big, then that's going to require you to check a lot of numbers. So uh, the the answer to the first the second question is very easy to check. It's hard to find because once you have the answer to the second question, you can multiply the numbers together and just figure out that yes, in fact, it works. But if you, don't, uh, if you don't know the answer, it's very hard to find it. So there goes the, uh, there's the heart of RSA. So what is the motivation of RSA? It's basically like, suppose you have a bank. The bank, you want to be able to tell the bank information that's like sort of secret. You want the bank to be able to de like decode your information and read it. Um, but you also want people to be able to send you information which is coded up. So how do you, basically send the bank messages, uh, how do you uh, encode the message without being given the ability to decode it, right? Like you want people to be able to send the bank messages without also having the ability to like, un, un like sort of uncode the message. Um, and RSA is essentially saying, well, uh, why don't we just use this prime number problem? We send people this really, really large prime number. It could be like hundreds of digits long. Uh, so a, a pseudo prime number. So like, uh, so like uh, it only ha it's a product of two very large prime numbers. You get this one number which is like hundreds of digits long, and then you give it to everyone else, and then they can use that number to uh, like sort of encode their message, send it back to you, and you're and the bank uh, is actually able to decrypt that message uh, so long as they know what two prime numbers multiplied together to get it, um, and that's the heart of RSA. So no, technically, no one's ever actually proved that you couldn't use a normal computer to, to crack RSA very, very fast. But no one has ever been able to do it. And it sounds like a generally hard problem. And so it's suspected to be impossible. And so essentially, uh, that's like what a lot of your banking security relies on, if that makes you sleep better at night. However, because it turns out that there's an algorithm called Shor's algorithm by a guy named Peter Shor, which is, turns out that if you had a quantum computer with enough qubits, you could actually break RSA. Uh, and if, the, if that were the case, well, RSA wouldn't be a viable, you know, sort of a secure way of, of um, a secure, like, a protocol for communicating data to, like, a bank or something. And so uh, if we had a strong enough uh, quantum computer, then, uh, you know, we will have achieved quantum supremacy on this kind of problem. Uh, and that would be sort of very concerning, I guess. Here's another example uh, for anyone who might uh, be interested in, in chemistry. So there's something called the Haber process. I'm not a chemist, so I don't know much about this, but the, it's apparently the main industrial way of fixing nitrogen into ammonia. So uh, generally uh, you might have like hydrogen. So like a hydrogen is basically two hydrogen atoms attached to each other and you might have nitrogen gas, which is two nitrogens attached to each other. Uh, but oftentimes like plants, for example, will fix nitrogen so they'll take those two molecules and they'll turn them into this molecule on the left called ammonia. This thing is uh, you know, very important industrially and sort of 
then the hopper process is basically this way of creating a, a lot of ammonia. And so it's used very extensively. But uh, to be honest, we, uh, as a, a, a species, don't quite understand uh, how, how this actually happens. Because if you think about it, uh, like atoms are essentially like, like many body problems. It's sort of like gravity. And just having a whole lot of them is super, super complicated. And now you're making it a quantum version of that problem. Um, and so that's very hard. Um, but, you know, uh, Feynman actually wrote a paper in the 1980s. Um, uh, is that right? That, that might be a bit late. Um, anyway, he, he wrote some paper at some point, uh, some very um, early on paper saying that, uh, well, if you want to simulate quantum, uh, you know, quantum systems, uh, it might be good to have like a quantum computer because obviously if you want to simulate quantum dynamics, you would like a computer that operates based off of quantum dynamics. Um, okay, so let's talk about some things that you would want a quantum computer to do. Uh, so in order for a quantum computer to really work, uh, there needs to be a few things that you keep in mind, um, and they're called the Di Vincenzo criteria. So if you have some quantum, if you, if you have some quantum system and you want to turn it into a quantum computer, these are the things that need to be true. Um, first, you need an idea of a qubit and a way to add more qubits to your computer. So what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, you need some uh, idea of what uh, zero, uh, what states represent zero, and, and what states represent one. So for example, in a classical computer, that might be like the amount of voltage going across a certain transistor or something like that. Uh, in a quantum computer, it might be the spin of an electron, whether it's pointed up or down. Um, and you also need a way to add more uh, qubits to your system. In, a way, in, in, in the sense that you need to scale your uh, system up. Obviously, if you have only one or two qubits, that's not particularly useful. Uh, the computer that you guys will be playing with, I believe, has five. Um, that's even not super, super useful either. Uh, but you want a, a way to basically uh, uh, scale up your computer to do ever more complicated processes. Um, and you would also like the ability of your qubit to start off in a given state. So obviously the qubit is of no use to you if you don't know what it started off being. So if you don't know if it's a zero or one, then it really doesn't help you at all. Um, you would like it to be able to do the calculation much faster than a qubit decays. I'm gonna come back to this. What does it mean for a qubit to decay? Well, if you think about it, uh, because we're talking about quantum mechanics, the scales are so incredibly small. Like you, your qubit might literally be like an atom's at like atomic state, and those sorts of things are super sensitive to the environment. So if you don't insulate that very very well, uh, then that would be very very bad. Are there questions? Um, I, I see stuff happening in the chat. Um, oh yeah, yeah. That was that was me. <laughs> okay. On the Sorry. right side, there are uh, quantum safe encryption algorithms so that quantum su supremacy won't completely destroy the world. Yes, this is a good point. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I, I talked about RSA as being sort of like a, a protocol for, uh, like that's very susceptible to being broken by quantum computing. But yes, it, it is true that there are other algorithms uh, that uh, you know, aren't actually uh, susceptible to, uh, to quantum computing. Um, and, so, and so you know we're not totally screwed, basically. That's true. Um, yeah, and so basically, uh, all qubits decay on some time scale because, you know, like eventually your qubit will just randomly interact with the environment by accident. And so you want to be able to do the calculation much faster than uh, the, the qubit decays. And that sounds very daunting. And in a way, it, it is like the driving question in the field today. But in another way, if you think about it, if you want to be more of an optimist, that was also the problem that people were, were running into when they're creating like sort of classical computers, like figuring out how do we make it so that like this, this, uh, this normal bit is sort of reliably storing this number uh, well enough that I can like trust it, uh, trust whatever result comes out. I need a way to change the state of the qubits in the same way that I need to be able to change the state of the bits in my, uh, in my computer in order to get it to work. And I need a way to measure the qubits. Um, and once I have all of these things, uh, and I can do these things very well, then I have a quantum computer which works. OK, let's move on. Uh, so quantum computers work in a very, very weird way. So they're sort of counterintuitive. So even if you've studied like computer science before, the way that you would code a quantum computer is extremely different than a way you would think about a normal computer. And why is that? Uh, I'm going to ask a question for you guys that I'd like you to answer really quickly. So suppose I have the statement that uh, I guess the answer is right here, but I, it'd, it'd help for you to guys for you guys to think about this question a little bit. 
So suppose uh, you have the statement, Alice likes apples and Bob likes bananas, right? So for this statement to be true, both Alice has, Alice both, both has to like banana, uh, apples and Bob has to like bananas. Um, both, both of those statements need to be true. So suppose I told you that it wasn't true, like that, that this statement as a whole wasn't true. Um, could you tell me like whether or not Alice likes apples or Bob likes bananas? Like is the answer to that, like can you, can you reverse an and basically? Um, so Yana, you should tell me what people say because uh, I can't see the chat. Okay. Wait, um, if you like, if you, the bar that you have, there's like three dots, you can access the chat from there if you want. Yeah, I think I just don't want to open it, like, because it's, yeah, it blocks sure. things. Yeah. Evan says, Alice doesn't like apples or Bob doesn't like bananas. That's right. That's right. Yes, that's true. Uh, so that's like a De Morgan's rule. But yes, in general, you know that either Alice doesn't like apples or Bob doesn't like bananas or both but you can't know one or the other. You can't know for sure that Alice doesn't like apples and you can't know for sure that Bob doesn't like bananas. So in a way, when you apply an and, so you say like A and B, you're sort of like deleting some of the information associated with the A and some information associated with the B. Uh, in, a, in a way, you can't reverse and. Uh, and so those kinds of operations, ands, ors, you cannot do those because in quantum computers cannot actually do operations uh, efficiently, which are uh, not reversible. And this is sort of a, a related to a principle in quantum mechanics called unitarity. Um, like, I mean, like, obviously, in principle, you could do these things, but if you did those things, then you basically um, uh, are deleting information, and it turns out that uh, your speed ups relating to quantum computing are, like don't really work out. And so, like, I mean, things like not, for example, you can do because if I said, not like Alice doesn't like apples, then you know that she, uh, and you said, and I said that that was false, then you would know that she does like apples. Like you can reverse that exactly. But when it comes to ands and ors or nans and nors, you can't uh, do those things um, uh, exactly the ways uh, that you're used to. Um, and so how do we really think about um, a qubit? Well, it turns out that a qubit uh, can be thought of as uh, being all of the points on a sphere. So if you look on the left, uh, if you look on the top, uh, that the top, uh, point of the sphere, the North Pole represents the zero state and the bottom represents the one. And it turns out every single point on the sphere represents uh, a different possible state. So the closer you're, so if you're on the equator, then basically that's like a, that's like a, a state, like a, an equal superposition between, um, uh, between zero and one. Uh, so if you measure that thing over and over again, it would either be zero or one. Uh, but it turns out that there's actually like a, an entire space uh, of, of possibilities. Uh, of being in superposition between these two. So this is sort of how you should visualize the states that are possible. And it turns out that the allowed uh, possible, uh, the allowed possible like gates you can apply. So like a gate might be an and or an or, or an and or an or or a not or something like that. Those are all uh, rotations. So any, any, anything that you can do is in, in a quantum computer is like a rotation on the sphere. So you can imagine, for example, that I could apply a not gate, which is basically a 180 degree rotation about, about like X or Y or something. Um, or, but if you think about it, this also uh, opens us up to a, a space of a bunch of new uh, things that we have never really expected we could do on a classical computer. So for example, I, like obviously, like I said, you can do a not gate, but you can also do a square root of not gate. So you could do an, instead of a 180 degree rotation, you could do a 90 degree rotation. Um, furthermore, because there are like sort of an infinite number of axes that you can rotate around, it turns out there are an infinite number of ways to do a square root of not gate. So if you look on the left, these are all possible ways uh, that you could sort of rotate your sphere in order to get a square root of not gate. And it turns out that all of these are sort of theoretically possible from a quantum computing perspective. And so that's the sense in which you get a lot more freedom uh, from quantum computers. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, which I mentioned before, is that quantum computers are interesting because you can't like check their work. So uh, quantum, uh, so when you measure a qubit, it collapses into a certain state. Um, it's true that you can choose to measure the qubit along a certain quote unquote basis. And this really amounts to like a choice of like North and South Pole. So like I could measure in the Z basis. So if you look on the left, I could ask like, oh, is it pointed upwards in Z or downwards in Z? 
and then I would get an answer, and then the qubit would promptly collapse into the state that uh, I, I measured. However, I could also ask, uh, like sort of measure it in the, Z, the x basis and ask, uh, is it more uh, pointed in the x direction or in the uh, in the minus x direction? Or I could ask, is it more oriented in the y direction or the minus y direction, right? But bear in mind that if I measure uh, like something in the x direction, uh, then my final state is going to be on the equator and I will have completely destroyed any information about, for example, z or y. Um, so measuring in one basis will basically destroy the answer to the, the, the question, like to, to if I asked about another basis. So to keep coherence, you only usually want to measure at the end, because if you measure in the middle of your calculation, you sort of destroy the su superpositions that are in your computer, and that's, that's, that's bad. Like you don't want to do that. That just makes it so that you don't really get the speed ups that you want. In addition, because uh, program results aren't deterministic in the sense that because quantum mechanics doesn't completely determine the future, uh, like sort of unambiguously, you oftentimes want to repeat the program over and over again uh, in order to sort of be absolutely sure of the answer. Uh, however, even if you do this, it turns out quantum computers are oftentimes faster than normal computers anyway, <laughs> at least from a theoretical perspective. Uh, and like I said, you cannot check the steps of a quantum computer because you can't measure it while it's running or you'll like mess it up. Um, and so that's sort of a, you know, that's sort of a pain point. Fortunately, like I said, a lot of the questions that we'd like to solve are questions which are easy to do one way and hard to do another way. So the answers are oftentimes easy to check, for example, in the, uh, for example, in RSA. Um, so I wanna show you this one demo of a thing. Uh, so we're gonna do a little bit of a pivot to, to sort of talking a little bit less practically. Um, so I wanted to show you guys this demo uh, sort of in person. Uh, we actually usually show this off, but unfortunately, I'm very far away from you guys, so I'll just show you this video. If you have 3D glasses, you can probably do this at home. So, so just as background, this is called a polarizer. Uh, it basically, uh, uh, one way of thinking about it is that it only lets a certain like direction of uh, um, electromagnetic wave come through. Another way of thinking about it is that it's measuring uh, the light qubit along a certain basis. So, so far things seem to be okay because you can think of it sort of as like fences, like uh, sort of like a, a metal slit fence in the sense that uh, you can like th sort of fit a Frisbee through a metal slit fence. But if you have two metal slit fences, which are like at perpendicular to each other, then a Frisbee going in one way won't fit through the second one. But then the, the, the weird thing is what happens when you put in a third polarizer. So I'll, I'll sort of let the video continue a bit. So it turns out you can do this demonstration live with some 3D glasses as well. So I just got a 3D glasses to show you, right? Yeah, so the 3D the glasses work on polarization. So you can see like right now there's this glass is essentially black because I have two of them that are perpendicular to each other. And now if I put a third one in between, it actually I'm not sure if you can see that, but it goes transparent. Do you see that? Yeah, so the, the critical thing to know here is that when you put in a third polarizer at 45 degrees, you actually increase the number of the amount of light that goes through, which seems super ridiculous, right? Because how, how can putting something sort of in the way, uh, like in the middle, basically let more light through? That like sort of doesn't really make any sense. Like that seems like super bizarre. Um, and so uh, that's sort of like, um, you know, one example of uh, uh, why uh, quantum mechanics is sort of very unintuitive. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. This is a little bit destroyed, but I'm going to pivot a little bit to reading quantum circuits. This is going to be a little bit fast because um, you're going to get a little bit of experience uh, about this when you do the homework.
but essentially I just wanted to sort of outline that uh, when you're reading a quantum circuit, you read it from left to right. So on the left, you, you write all of the, the qubits that you start with. So in this case, they all start as zero. And as, they, as, as you sort of read from left to right, um, you see that all of these little boxes represent like different things that you could possibly do. And so for example, um, these boxes on the very right represent measuring the qubit, which you can see is completely to the right, which means you do that at the end. These things would be like, for example, different kinds of rotations, these are all like examples of different kinds of rotations you could do on the, uh, like not, not just on a single block sphere, but actually between two qubits. So this is called a Hadamard. It's, called, it's also known as an entangling gate, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and there are also these things called C knots. Uh, these are actually not, actually Hadamards are not entangling, but C knots are entangling. So Hadamards are essentially like, you can think of them kind of like square root of knot gates. Whereas Hadamards, or whereas, whereas C naught gates are entangling in the sense that um, you can create quantum entanglement between your qubits. And it turns out that quantum entanglement is is the reason why uh, you get you, you sort of get like that uh, n qubits is equal to two to the n normal bits. It's because that uh, uh, in normal uh, classical mechanics you can't entangle things together, whereas in uh, quantum mechanics you have the complete ability to do that, and that opens up a whole a new space of states, which is possible. Um, okay, so I want to talk a bit, a bit about entanglement just as a review. So I know that Jan talked about it last time, but I do want to mention it again. Is that uh, the, the classical example, suppose that Shashir and Shank, uh like split the money and buy two gloves. So they're in a, a set like left and right handed, I guess. But like, like for this example, for more, for more concreteness, they're red and blue. And suppose like they have the same favorite color and couldn't decide uh, which one, like, like you know, for each person to get, uh, and I'm not going to tell you what that color is, but they know. Um, and so uh, they put one glove in in a, in in each box. So they have two boxes, uh, and they're identical boxes, and each one has a glove. And so they they decide like, oh, because we don't know which glove is in which box, we're just going to take one and go home, and like you know, live with the consequences. So Shir goes home uh, and sees that he has the red glove and is either very happy or very disappointed. But in any case, he knows that because he got the red glove, he knows that Shashank uh, has the blue glove, which seems to be like a pretty straightforward thing. And so um, quantum, quantum entanglement from a classical perspective doesn't sound super, super surprising, um, but it helps to ask ourselves why it doesn't feel surprising. Well, it doesn't feel surprising because we sort of think that like, oh, even though Shashir and Shashank didn't like know what the outcome of the measurement would be, the gloves had already decided. So the boxes had already decided like beforehand what they're going to say. And so from a classical perspective, that's not so surprising, right? Um, and so uh, there are sort of two reasonable assumptions that we can make, which I think are super, super reasonable from a classical perspective, which is one, that the boxes know which gloves that they have before we look, uh, in the sense that like they don't decide like on the spot. They like, you know, they 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 know ahead of time. Uh, like the gloves, uh, know which gloves they are before they're measured. Uh, that's called determinism, which we've mentioned before. It's also called realism in this context. And there's another another assumption called locality, which is that the boxes cannot change their mind after they're separated. That seems pretty reasonable too, because like in special relativity, you can't really transmit information faster than the speed of light. And so you expect that, that to be the case that you can't, like one glove can't talk to another glove really, really far away. Um, and so from, from the classical point of view, what this means is like, uh, the, glo like the, the gloves are basically put in the boxes, the boxes are separated, and then the gloves can't switch places. This seems super reasonable. It turns out that John Bell showed that if you assume those two things, you can actually do some math and show that you can like do some experiment in the lab and find that some number s has to be less than two. And you can actually go and you can measure that number to be two times square root of two, which is more than two. So you can basically experimentally prove that one of those two things is wrong. Um, however, it is not known which of those two things is actually wrong. Uh, and it, it's not even very well known if that question is reasonable uh, or like meaningful. But in any case, just think about that. Like, which of those things are you more likely to let go of? Like, uh, like the tenants that you have, uh, you know, so tenderly created in uh, special relativity are now getting destroyed, or uh, you lose determinism, uh, which is sort of very disappointing, I guess, 
uh, 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 from some like uh, aesthetic point of view. Um, and so this sort of leads to interpretations of quantum mechanics. I'm not going to go super in depth because it's my understanding that this was discussed in a uh, section, but uh, there are some interpretations of quantum mechanics which are like, uh, like you know, of course we have the math of quantum mechanics, but how do we actually think about what's going on? Like, what's our mental picture? Uh, and it, it must be said, I think it's very important to say that you can't discern these uh, interpretations at the moment uh, experimentally. There's no known way to do it. And so uh, for the time being, people basically all have their own opinions about what's going on. I, and I, I really mean that earnestly, like people all have different opinions, like nobody really agrees uh, on like what's actually going on. Uh, but there are three really popular ones. One's called Copenhagen, which is just like, like just do the math. Uh, like there's basically something very deeply important about measurement, um, uh, which is sort of, some people think that that's a cop out. Uh, there's another, interpretation called many worlds, uh, which is basically every time a quantum decision is made, the universe splits up into multiple parallel universes in which the different outcomes happen. And there's another, and in, in, in the first two cases, notice how we've basically discarded determinism. In the last uh, case, uh, there's something called uh, Bohmian pilot wave theory, or also known as de Broglie-Bohm uh, mechanics. Uh, it's, a, it's what's known as a hidden variable theory. Uh, which is a theory that uh, basically says that, oh, well, things are actually deterministic, but there are certain things that we can't measure about a system. Like, we just can't know. But if we knew those things, like, somehow, uh, then, like, we would reproduce all the, the consequences of quantum mechanics. And so uh, that's, uh, that actually discards locality. Um, and the way that they reconcile, uh, like, losing locality with not being able to send things faster than speed of light is that because you can't measure these things, even if, uh, like, you know, sort of two qubits talk to each other, even when they're really far apart, you can't actually go and check that, that, that they've done so. And so from your point of view, you can't transmit information. Um, and uh, that one's also quite controversial as well. In fact, all of these have their controversies, and nobody agrees on any of them. Uh, and so maybe, you know, one day we'll figure out uh, which one is the most appropriate. But for now, it's, it's a very much like an opinionated debate. Um, and as I said, superluminal communication seems to uh, be violated uh, by entanglement in the sense that uh, because, uh, let's just say that uh, for the sake of argument that the qubits actually don't decide, um, like- Sorry, super, superluminal means faster sorry, than, faster speed, than of light. speed of light. Yeah, uh, let's assume like for the moment, let's go back to the Shashir and Shashank glove thing, but instead they've like, like gone to the store and they've bought like two spins, which are like oriented in opposite directions, but they don't know which. Um, and so entanglement uh, basically appears to violate the speed of light in the sense that, well, we've said that like we think that the qubits haven't decided yet what they're going to be before they're measured. So if Shashir measures a qubit, he basically also measured Shashank's qubit, even though Shashank's qubit could be like on Mars or something. Um, and, and that seems like very bizarre. Like, how is it possible that you could make a measurement of something so far away? And the question is, could you like use that to send messages faster than the speed of light? You know, there's science fiction like, uh, some books in my room which say that like, oh, they use that as a plot point that uh, you can uh, use this mechanism to transmit messages really, really quickly, sort of unphysically quickly. But it turns out that no, you can't actually transmit information in that way uh, because you can't actually control uh, the outcome of your measurement. You can only know uh, that, you're, that you're, you know, friend like on Mars uh, basically measures the opposite thing. So, so uh, when I so, said in special relativity that the speed of light can be thought of as a speed of information. Um, this this part still holds. Yeah. So in the sense that you can't send messages, uh, like basically, if you if Shashir and Shashank have like a whole bunch of uh, qubits which are entangled to each other, uh, then like if Shashir measures all of his qubits, he knows Shashank's qubits exactly. But because he can't control what the qubits are going to like be, both of them basically just have random strings of like. Uh, information, uh, which are basically like, you know, don't hold any sort of communicable message. Okay, um, there's another philosophical question I would like to talk about, which is called Wigner's friend, which is sort of a little bit more problematic, um, uh, sort of from an interpretational perspective. Um, and it comes from fundamentally from the fact that quantum mechanics, actually, we think about it as applying to small things, but really it applies to like everything. Like, 
from a very macroscopic point of view, you should also expect quantum mechanics to hold. So here's the sense in which this is the case. Um, so let's say there's a guy named Wigner. In fact, this is uh, the physicist Eugene Wigner, because he sort of came up with this. But suppose Wigner has a friend in a sealed room who measures uh, a qubit. So he, his friend is in some room. He has like a spin, and he doesn't know what the spin is in. But he measure. But so uh, the friend measures the, the qubit as either zero or one. And then Wigner is like very far away from all of this. Like he hasn't looked at the friend at all. Like he's very separated from the friend. And then later on, uh, he measures the system, and he uh, like measures like the entangled system of the friend plus the qubit uh, together. Uh, and then the question is, well, when did the like qubit actually decide whether it was a zero or a one? When did the outcome actually collapse to a zero or a one? So the friend would say, well, it collapsed as soon as I measured it. Uh, but Wigner would say, no, actually the qubit collapsed like when I measured you and the qubit later on. And so that comes to a very interpretational question of, you know, what the hell is happening? Because it's not like the friend is basically in like cryostasis until like Wigner measures him. Like clearly the friend feels like they've already like, you know, experienced some like, you know, uh, like they've already made this measurement. Uh, and so who's like actually right about when the qubit has actually decided to be zero or one? And so, uh, and so this is sort of a question that is not particularly answerable. Uh, without assuming some sort of interpretation. Wigner interpreted this to uh, require some sort of con uh, role for consciousness uh, uh, when, when talking about measurement in the sense that like, oh, well, like a measurement of a system fundamentally is tied to consciousness. But this is very controversial. It could also be the case that like, well, a measurement is really entangling yourself to a system, which is an interpretation I'm pretty partial to. Um, and, and in that uh, sense, it's like, you don't have to be like conscious to measure something. But ultimately, uh, these questions are sort of very nebulous. And even though we know how to describe quantum mechanics from a mathematical perspective very well, this is still sort of very problematic. OK. Um, yeah, OK. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the reason why quantum computing is so difficult. So I mentioned before that there's um, uh, sort of an issue with the environment messing up your qubits. And this is called decoherence. So the question is, um, so I mean, we've talked about Schrodinger's catalog and how it can be both dead and alive, but indeed in real life, uh, this doesn't ever happen. In fact, Schrodinger himself made up the Schrodinger's cat in order to try and uh, make quantum mechanics sound ridiculous because he thought that it was like, didn't make any sense. Um, and so the question is, is very simple. If quantum mechanics is true, why isn't the cat ever actually both dead and alive in reality? Why is it always one or the other? And the answer is decoherence. Uh, when you have an object which is as big as a cat, the fundamentally, like, you know, in, from a toy problem sense, you could say, like, oh, I don't measure the cat. But in reality, the environment is always constantly measuring the cat and is always entangling itself to the cat, uh, uh, destroying its quantum coherence and making it act sort of more classically. Uh, and obviously, like, this is like, I guess, depending on your perspective, it's like good because things make sense, uh, you know, on a macroscopic scale um, and sort of like our, our classical dynamics are recovered. Uh, because of decoherence. But from a, a, a quantum computing perspective, this is really bad because if you your environment is constantly destroying your quantum coherences, then your quantum computer is basically going to die. Like, like all of the things that make it uh, sort of advantageous to use a quantum computer are no longer true anymore because it just like after a little while, all of your quantum coherences are gone. And so uh, essentially you, you have to do either two things. You have to either make your operations very, very fast uh, so that your qubit decays, but like it decays way after uh, you're done with your calculation. Or alternatively, um, you need to make your qubits live a really long time. And sort of both of those things are, are, uh, are things that people are pushing for. And so uh, I want to bring your attention to sort of the, the very frontier of what people are trying to do today. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that I'm leaving out. Um, but one, I, one big idea is something called quantum error correction. And so in order to understand what quantum error correction is, it helps to basically understand the classical idea of classical error correction. Uh, people don't really do this kind of thing uh, nowadays, is my, is my uh, understanding. Uh, but back in the day, uh, when people were first creating uh, computers, they had this idea of like, oh, I have a bit, and like I have a, it's either a zero or a one. But the environment might mess up 
might mess it up and turn a zero into a one or a one into a zero. This is called a bit flip. But the idea is, well, maybe I want like the information to get across with like with a very low probability of getting messed up. So what I might do is I might take a zero and I might store it as a zero, 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 and I might take a one and store it as a one, one, one. And why would I want to do that? Well, if I, if Shashir sends a zero, zero, zero to Shashank, and Shashank measures a zero, one, zero, then Shashank thinks like, oh, well, either like one qubit was messed up and it's a zero, 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 or two qubits were messed up and it was a one, 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 uh, or two bits in this case. And then uh, Shashank might say, well, it's more likely that it was a zero, 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 so I'm just going to assume that that's the case, and I will make many fewer errors that way because uh, it's so much less probable that two bits were messed up than one. Um, and so the quantum idea is very similar. It's like you can take uh, cu uh, like many qubits, you know, let's say three qubits, uh, and like sort of put them all in the same state. And then uh, every so often, you can apply some set of gates, some quantum gates, to uh, take any to take any errors and sort of correct them. Um, uh, and so that's that's very. Uh, a very good idea. In fact, that's what people are trying to do nowadays. And the reason why that's a good idea is it turns out that if you can do this well enough, uh, then it turns out that you can basically correct errors arbitrarily well. Uh, that as long as your error correction is is high enough fidelity, you can basically make it so that uh, after applying the quantum error correction a whole bunch of times, uh, you can get the error as small as you want. However, the issue is that correction also introduces error. So for example, Everything introduces error. You know, just the qubits being there with the possibility of interacting with the environment introduces error. Uh, but also, like doing things to the qubit, like rotating them around, entangling them to each other, uh, you know, measuring them, all of these things introduce error. Uh, and so you basically want your correction to be good enough so that you can overcome that error. And that's been very, very difficult. Uh, it, it, of course, is much more difficult as you increase the number of qubits as well. So let's talk about some real examples of qubits in reality. So I've been a little bit abstract about what kind of quantum systems actually count as qubits. Um, people have been very creative and versatile about what kinds of quantum systems they can use. Um, but I would like to sort of tell you about sort of the big ones. Um, I'm going to be excluding a, a whole class of other kinds of qubits as well. But I hope that uh, what I show you is going to be fairly comprehensive and give you a fairly good perspective of what people are trying to do nowadays. So atomic systems, atoms. Atoms are um, basically sort of the fundamental building block of, of matter in our universe, uh, in the sense that like um, atoms are like, like the smallest indivisible unit of matter, which can still be identified as like a given element. So for example, uh, what is the smallest unit of gold that you could have uh, is actually one atom of gold. Because once you break it up, you're going to break it up into its constituent fundamental particles and it's no longer going to uh, be associated with any chemical identity. So atoms are uh, basically made up of like a positively, pos positively charged nucleus, which is really heavy, so you can think like the sun, uh, versus negatively charged electrons which are orbiting it. Think of, like, think of it as like planets. And so in a sense, because it's electromagnetism, and electromagnetism looks very similar to, uh, to, uh, to gravity, this is, is very reminiscent of like sort of a classical version of the gravitational problem, um, and so, um, and so, like I said, quantum mechanics becomes important here. And one thing that I would like to point out is that because uh, the electrons are bound to the nucleus, so they're not allowed to go really far away. They're like attached, basically. They're like attracted very strongly. Uh, the electrons are what are called bound, uh, which means, if you remember from your uh, quantum mechanics lecture, that the energy levels are discrete. Uh, they're not continuous. The electron can't base. They can't take any possible energy. It can only take certain values of the energy, and um, and this turns out to be very very important for quantum computing. So what you can do is you can take two quantum uh, two atomic levels of some electron, and you can call that your qubit. Um, it doesn't really like from a theoretical perspective. It doesn't matter which of those two levels you pick, as long as you pick two levels, uh, and you just say that's your qubit. Uh, practically, it's a different matter because you want to pick levels which don't decay very fast. You want to pick levels that you can manipulate pretty easily, uh, things like that. Uh, but once you do that, uh, uh, you know, atoms are pretty easy to initialize. You wait until they decay uh, if it's a certain kind of atom. 
Uh, and you can also apply some uh, electromagnetic field to, to basically wiggle the atom, uh, similar to how you would wiggle uh, your legs on a, on a swing set to get yourself to go higher. It turns out that you can do an analogous sort of thing uh, and cause what's called a dipole transition. And what this, what this is is basically like um, a changing from one state to another. Um, and, that, and that's how you would do it. So I'm going to show a, little, a few animations Here's one animation. So this is a, a, a simulation online, which basic, can you guys see my screen, uh, the simulation? Yep. Um, cool. So this is a solver, which basically shows like the first few energy levels of any uh, quantum uh, well. So for example, I can just change these parameters. This is a rectangle, but of course, what I actually want to do is go to a Coulomb potential, which is sort of most close to an atom. So you can see that these are like, this is basically just solving for the first few uh, electron cloud, uh, like sort of uh, uh, states uh, of an electron. And so you can see that like it, it arranges itself in these sort of weird patterns. Uh, but let me show you what it's like to, uh, what it looks like um, to uh, do a transition between these levels. So let's do like an interesting one. Like uh, let's say I have, let's do an S1. So let's say I start off with this circular state and I can apply this light, which is sort of this spinning, um, this like wiggling light is sort of the spinning thing on the, the bottom right corner is representing the like the electric field. So like essentially the light that you're applying. And so you can see that if you, uh, if you sort of wiggle the light fast enough and sort of in the correct way, and you look at the center, you can see that the state is like constantly changing. Um, so it's sort of, goes back and forth between being this sort of ring pattern and being this circular pattern. And this is uh, essentially uh, representing what's called a dipole transition. Um, I, I particularly like this visualization. It sort of shows how like different ways of wiggling the atom can tr turn certain um, uh, states into other states. So here's another example. And, and of course, there are some uh, other examples like this. Uh, it stops, yeah. So uh, yeah, so here's, uh, another fundamental example. So yeah, I, I thought this animation was pretty cool. Um, can I make this full screen again? Nope, hold on. Okay, um, there's another kind of system called a spin system, which is basically sort of an intrinsic discrete angular momentum. So from a classical perspective, the way you, you kind of think about this is like this, the like, the, the Earth has an angular, two kinds of angular momentum. It has one kind because of its motion around the sun and another kind because it's spinning on its axis. Um, and so spin is sort of like spinning on its axis, like the Earth spinning on its axis. But the thing is like spin is very weirdly behaved. It doesn't behave like normal angular momentum. But nevertheless, um, it's sort of like analogous. The thing about spin is it's also discrete. It can only, uh, for electrons, it can only take on one of two values, up or down. Uh, photons are what are called spin one, but because they're massless, it turns out they also have uh, two states. And so both of them are like pretty obvious qubits because, you know, they both have very, two very well-defined states. They can be manipulated with magnetic fields and entangled with each other and so on. And so this is also uh, what is uh, thought of as a viable qubit and sort of like the prototypical example of, uh, of, a, of a qubit. Another example is uh, what are called trapped ions. Trapped ions are essentially where you take um, atoms, you sort of knock off or add extra electrons in order to give the, uh, the atom a, an overall charge. And then you can use electromagnetic fields to hold the atoms in place uh, in midair. Uh, in, in fact, in a vacuum, because you don't want anything to interact with it. Uh, and since trapping is usually strongest in one direction, uh, you actually uh, tend to trap the ions in a line, which I'll show you uh, in a second. And because the ions are bound to the trap, their vibrations are also quantized. So because you're trapping the ions and they can't leave the trap, it turns out that their vibrations are also a quantum system. So here's an example of like just a picture of a whole bunch of calcium, uh, 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 calcium ions, like all, uh, all initialized in a trap. So because you're squeezing really hard in one direction and not very hard in another, the, the ions actually arrange into this line. Uh, and so these people, these folks in 2011 actually went and entangled 14 of these calcium ions all together in this trap and took this very nice picture. Um, it turns out, like I said, that you can actually uh, uh, go and figure out uh, that because 
Uh, so if you remember, I don't know if we ever talked about the quantum harmonic oscillator, but it turns out that the oscillations of the atoms inside of this uh, electromagnetic trap uh, can be thought of as like a harmonic oscillator. And so uh, quantum harmonic oscillators actually have discrete energy levels as well because they're bound. And so, uh, and so they can actually be used to like transmit information between qubits in the trap. So what you might want to do is like entangle the state of a, uh, one of the ions to the, the vibration then entangle another one of the ions to the vibration and stop the vibration, and then your two ions will be uh, entangled to each other. And that's sort of a very common way of doing things um, uh, uh, in, this, in this field. So here are some uh, pictures of like this oscillation. What's really going on is people have um, basically uh, sort of initialized the system in the state many times and just sort of taken pictures of them at each point. And you can see that you can uh, see that you can either have the uh, a kind of oscillation where all of the uh, uh, the ions move together, uh, which is uh, called a center of mass mode. Or you might have uh, other modes like this mode called the breathing mode, which is the one on the bottom left, which is where the uh, the ions actually move far away from each other and come back together, move far away from each other and come back together, and um, and that's also like a, a way of transmitting information. And there are actually many many others as well. Uh, sort of similarly to how we talked about normal modes before, uh, there's sort of a, a analogous way of thinking about it uh, in in a in a in a uh, an ion trap. Uh, there is another kind of uh, qubit that you can think of, which is called a Rydberg atom. Rydberg atoms are essentially atoms which are highly excited. So if you look on the left, uh, typically when we talk about hydrogen, we think like, oh, there are some energy levels, but it turns out that hydrogen has an infinite number of energy levels. Uh, most of the energy levels are clustered up at the top. If you look on the, the left picture, they're uh, like all the way, like between the ionization energy and like like a large N, you can see that like basically you have to fit an infinite number of states there. And Rydberg, Rydberg atoms are essentially like uh, systems where the one of the electrons is like super far out. And it turns out that uh, the radius of a Rydberg atom is actually go like, increases as the square of the the atomic number n which means that if you have n is like 137 which is like the the number of the excited state that's about one micrometer or about one red blood cell so you essentially have an atom which is like effectively as big as a red blood cell which is kind of interesting and so Rydberg atoms can uh, uh, prevent atoms near them from also being Rydberg just because they're just so big uh, it turns out that you can use this to your advantage and and these are also a very uh, recent, intriguing sort of like seemingly magical way of of doing quantum information science. Uh, so here's like a picture of one of the 137th level of a hydrogen Rydberg atom. So basically, they've taken an electron and they've excited it all the way up to the 137th level. Um, Rydberg atoms uh, and other kinds of things can be sort of combined in, in what's called an optical lattice, which is where you take light waves. Uh, you basically um, uh, create like a, a like a lattice uh, using like the like oscillations of a light wave. It's like um, if you look, it's sort of like analogous to like a, a material, like sort of a crystal, except you basically make the crystal out of light, and the light basically holds all of the atoms in place. And so this is sort of the picture on the right. And this is also super interesting because you basically can like simulate a material in in a sense, like uh, by like. Uh, and you have like very fine-tuned control in the sense that, uh, well, you know, you, uh, because you control what light you're using to make the optical lattice, you can like change the spacing of the optical lattice, or you could like change uh, how hard it is for uh, atoms to jump between them and, and certain things like this. And in that sense, optical lattices are very promising. There are also optical tweezers, which very recently won a Nobel Prize for Arthur Ashkin. They're actually used in multiple contexts, not just in quantum information science. So for example, you can actually use them to hold up glass beads uh, that are very, very small. And this is actually applied to biophysics many times because what you do is you essentially like stick a piece of DNA or you stick a cell uh, to um, some optical tweezers, uh, sorry, to some glass orb and you can hold it up and you can basically use light as tweezers of these microscopic objects and move them around and look at them and stuff. But it turns out it also works for atoms. Uh, in particular, I believe that it works, um, uh, if I remember correctly, it works well for atoms which can be polarized uh, pretty easily. Um, that's my understanding. But in any case, uh, people will do things like optical tweezer arrays, 
uh, like this one on the uh, yeah, like this one on the right, uh, which is from a paper from uh, the Lucan group, uh, where, where basically what you can do is you can have a whole bunch of optical tweezers next to each other, uh, and basically like make it so that you have like a one-dimensional array of atoms all being held with optical tweezers. Optical tweezers are interesting because you can basically like uh, they're like tweezers, like literally tweezers almost, in the sense that you can move them like back and forth. And, and, and basically have very fine-tuned control about um, basically uh, like how close you want your atoms to be. So on this left, for example, uh, and uh, one thing that you can do is you can like put like a sodium atom in, in one tweezer and you can put a cesium atom in another tweezer. You can move the tweezers really close together and force them to interact with each other and make a molecule. So if you've ever, ever taken chemistry, uh, you'll know that sodium and cesium are both alkali atoms and it makes no sense for them to be in a molecule but it turns out that you can actually construct these things in a lab using optical tweezers because instead of relying on like these thermodynamic um, interactions you can just sort of force them to do it uh, sort of force them to bind to each other by just moving them close to each other it turns out i actually have some, we actually we actually have some friends in the physics department who uh, work on this kind of thing um, and it's actually very quite exciting because you can do chemistry on things that you never thought would actually appear in reality. Um, here's another picture that I wanted to show. Uh, this is a very nice picture that won some photographic award. Um, if you look on the left, this is sort of like a, a like a an electromagnetic trap. And if you look on the right, you can see this little dot. That dot is actually a picture of an atom that is being held by the trap. And so somebody actually, this guy named David Madlinger realized, he did some calculations and thought, actually this, guy, this, this atom is giving off enough light for you to actually be able to see it if you point your camera there for long enough. And so sure enough, he did this and was able to photograph a single atom. So this is like not like, not like a group of atoms, it's like literally one atom. Um, here's another video which I'd like to show you, um, which is very cool. Um, these are... Uh, I've been told that these are actually carbon monoxide molecules. I'm not sure they're atoms. Um, but in any, any case, um, each of these dots is actually um, a molecule. So um, this is actually the smallest uh, movie that's ever been made. Sorry, so this is actually a scanning tunneling microscope that was used to make this, not a scanning right, exactly, electron yeah. microscope. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is my mistake. This is a, yeah, I must have just written it wrong. Yeah, this is a scanning, scanning tunneling microscope. So what's happening here is that there's some like very, very fine pointed microscope tip, which is being, uh, so th it's a microscope in the sense that you can um, sort of scan it across the surface. And because of quantum tunneling, uh, stuff on the surface of the material will actually jump to the tip of your uh, microscope, uh, like tip, and like because like based on like how close the tip is to the surface, like the tunneling will be different, um, and you'll get more or less current. Oh, uh, whoops. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the idea. Like you know, like think about in order to make this kind of movie, you actually have to go frame by frame and like like move these atoms around individually. And so each of these frames was constructed sort of uh, synthetically by like literally moving single atoms around. So that sort of gives you an idea of what kinds of stuff that we can do nowadays. Super exciting. Um, here's the final thing that I wanted to tell you about, which is called superconducting qubits. So in electromagnetism, um, you might, if you've ever taken a class like this, so it's fine if not, but uh, there's something called an LC circuit, which is on the left. It's a kind of circuit which oscillate, whose voltage oscillates back and forth. And if you think about it, because it's, it's an oscillating circuit, it basically is mathematically equivalent to uh, a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and because it's a quantum system, technically, um, it's, it can be thought of as a quantum harmonic oscillator, which is a bound system. And so actually it turns out that in quantum mechanics, the oscillations of this guy are actually also quantized. 
And so it turns out that if you use a special kind of inductor, which is this thing on the left called the Josephson junction, uh, then you can create what's called a superconducting qubit, uh, which is uh, very immensely helpful uh, in, in modern day quantum information processing, or, or I should say uh, very promising. Uh, and so I'm not going to explain super in depth what a Josephson junction is, but it's basically a kind of circuit element which is based off of uh, quantum tunneling. Uh, it basically acts like a an inductor, kind of. Uh, but if that if those words don't mean anything, it's totally fine. So one thing which is kind of problematic about uh, a normal LC circuit is that quantum harmonic oscillators have equally spaced levels. Uh, and so if you try and excite something from the bottom state to the first state you'll accidentally excite something from the first state to the second state as well, and from the second state to the third state as well. Um, and you don't really want to do that because you want to be able to have a well-defined qubit. And the reason, one reason why you would use a Josephson junction is because uh, they're not exactly the same as normal inductors. So you can see that they actually change what the potential looks like uh, for the quantum system. So like you can compare the left to the right. They actually slightly change uh, the spacing between the levels uh, this is called anharmonicity because it's like how far away you are from a normal harmonic oscillator. You sort of need that in order to uh, to prevent yourself from accidentally exciting to upper states. Um, and so that's uh, super interesting. Uh, I, I want to remind you what's actually going on here is you're literally taking an entire circuit, like a macroscopic circuit, and you're putting the entire thing under quantum superposition. So that's pretty insane uh, to me. Um, and so here's a, one of our professors on the left, Irfan Siddiqui, who's very well known for his work on superconducting qubits. Um, basically, like, they're literally circuits under superposition. And so they're easy to scale up, which is an advantage, at least straightforward. Like, you can imagine, like, just like a normal circuit, you just stack a bunch of circuits on top of each other, link them together. And that's sort of like, you can sort of see in your head how it would be easier to connect them together. However, the disadvantage is that because they're so big, uh, they need to be kept very cool. So this thing on the left is actually a dilution refrigerator. And so it's like many, many levels. Uh, so like each of those levels is like a different temperature all the way going down to the bottom, which is like the lowest. And so like, because it's it, like, you literally need it to be like millikelvin, microkelvin kind of thing. Like very, like, like thousands or like millions degrees above like absolute zero uh, or else that like the, the random fluctuations caused by the temperature are enough to destroy your qubit. And even then, uh, super superconducting qubits tend to not last very long. Uh, they tend to last like, if I remember correctly, like on the order of microseconds rather than milliseconds for top ions or something. And so uh, obviously, like, uh, if you want to be able to use super superconducting qubits, you actually either need to do your computations much faster, or you need to be able to improve your uh, ability uh, to like maintain a superconducting qubit. Um, it turns out that this is like a very uh, popular thing for people to want to do. So Google, IBM, these sorts of people who, like these companies, which are, uh, uh, you know, they have skin the game in quantum computing, uh, tend to give a lot of attention to superconducting qubits. And so, for example, um, like, the, like the folks at IBM have actually made like a, a very primitive uh, five qubit quantum computer very, very publicly accessible. And that's going to be sort of like something you're going to play with on your homework just very uh, quickly. Uh, you're going to basically, I think what, what I have you do is entangle some qubits together, uh, which is sort of very fun to be able to tell your friends that you did. Um, yeah, and so uh, here's one of my final photos, which is on the left. Uh, here's like a dilution refrigerator, but with every, like all of the, the stuff on the outside stripped off. So you can see how this is really an incredible piece of engineering and also extremely complicated looking. Um, but if you go over there and you zoom in and you look at one of the uh, qubits, in fact, if you look on the right, this is actually four qubits. Uh, they're what are called transmon qubits, but essentially it's the same idea. It's a superconducting qubit with some improvements, which uh, sort of, uh, I, I believe it increases like uh, how uh, long lived they are or something like this. But this, uh, this is also a very popular architecture. Um, and so here's the maybe uh, last thing that I want to talk about, which is called a solid state defect. Um, these are a little bit more off the beaten path, but actually uh, they have a special place in my heart because both Yana and I uh, work on these. Uh, so uh, solid state defects are essentially like mistakes in like crystal lattices. So uh, when you think of a diamond, you might think of like a pristine, like perfect uh, lattice of carbon atoms, 
And that's like the nice cartoon picture. But in reality, nothing is perfect. And so your diamond actually has mistakes in it. And so one mistake might be this thing on the right, which is like, instead of having a carbon where you're supposed to have one, you have a nitrogen. And next to the nitrogen, you actually have a hole. So this is called nitrogen vacancy center. This is one example of a solid state defect. And it turns out that these irregularities in the lattice actually oftentimes have their own uh, bound states. They, they have their own electronic levels. They sort of behave as like uh, atoms which have been trapped in a lattice by God in the sense that you don't need to trap them with a, uh, as, as you do an ion trap because they're just stuck there. Um, but they have their disadvantages as well. Like if the, if the entire material shakes, then like the, the electronic state might be affected uh, uh, because it might be sort of connected to the uh, vibration of the, the, the material, for example. Um, but nevertheless, it's super, super promising as well. Uh, and there are people who definitely try to use these as qubits. Um, uh, and there are very fascinating papers where people basically entangle NV centers to uh, photons uh, like that are like kilometers away. Uh, and, and it's very, very interesting. Um, actually, I think I think what the what, what people have done is they've taken two NV centers in two different labs and like entangled them with a photon, but the labs are like kilometers apart or something like that. So it's really, really quite remarkable what kind of stuff people can do. Um, in fact, I, I think I even remember some papers recently in the last few years where like some Chinese scientists actually like entangle stuff to like a satellite, uh, like qubit or something like that, like something like in space, if I remember correctly. And so like what can be done is really, really quite remarkable. Um, so that's my last slide. I have about five minutes left. So if you have any questions, um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll take any questions now. Obviously, it's like a lot to take in. Um, this is uh, quantum information is sort of more on the frontier of of um, of, uh, uh, of of physics. So it's not like any of the stuff that I've told you about before, where we basically knew how everything worked. Like we pretty much like know what thermodynamics is, what classical mechanics is, uh, even quantum mechanics. We have a pretty good grasp on. I would say, like at least from the fundamental point of view. But quantum information science is something that's sort of being worked on day to day. Like people still work on it. It's still a very thriving field of research. As you can see, there are still big outstanding goals and questions that we still want to answer. And that's not even to mention that I haven't like talked about a lot of different things uh, uh, that like, like we didn't even have any time to get, get to. So for example, uh, some people uh, uh, investigate, like they simulate essentially like black holes uh, using quantum circuits in order to try and understand stuff about quantum gravity, or they might uh, investigate uh, uh, like sort of what are called non-equilibrium systems like, so you might have heard of like time crystals, for example. Um, like all of that stuff fits under the purview of like atomic physics, which I've sort of lumped in here uh, when talking about quantum information science. Um, and so, yeah, it's really a thriving field for sure. Like it's like right on the frontier. And I thought I would really like to share this with you guys because it's something that like, uh, I definitely felt like when I was first learning about it, people would say things like, oh, you have like a system which is like, both a zero and a one at the same time, and I, no one could ever explain to me like why, like why that actually meant that it was is good for computing. Um, but yeah, are there any questions? Um, I'm having a hard time opening the chat. Zoom is doing this weird thing where they're like. I can tell you, nobody has said anything so far. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Close his birthday today, so. Oh, no, that's also true. Oh, yeah. It's Nicholas's <laughs> I'm, birthday I'm today. I'm in superposition between uh, a, a child and adult. <laughs> Bring in the happy birthday. Graciously lectured us on our birthday. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. For what it's worth. <gasps> um. It was just a side question, but the 137th orbital for that hydrogen atom, the Rydberg atom. Yeah. Did they choose that because it was the fine structure constant? Or was there actually a reason? I actually don't know. So that's just a picture on Wikipedia. I, they might have also chosen mm -hmm. it because it was like coincidentally close to one micrometer or something. <laughs> oh, it, yeah. it might also be, but well, 137 is also a very aesthetic number, obviously, in, in right? at least you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's one over the yeah. fine structure constant, which we'll talk about next time. Um, by the way, I should say from here on out, uh, like the, the last two lectures are basically applications of quantum mechanics. 
but from very fundamentally different points of view. So this one is basically like, like you know, um, like using it as a, a, like a platform for quantum computation, but also sort of like, um, like a way of like investigating like atoms like in normal conditions. Um, next time we'll talk about particle physics, which is basically uh, particles at very very uh, high energies where relativity becomes important. And then after that, we'll have a guest lecture from someone who uh, talks about solid state physics, and will tell you basically about um, what happens when you put when you uh, basically put particles on a, a a discrete grid rather than letting them like be free. Turns out that um, there are very interesting consequences there. Uh, so we're going to so a few things because it looks like we don't have much time left and there are not so many questions. Um, uh, we're going to put up a link soon where we're going to ask you to uh, by next week come up with some uh, idea for what you want your final paper to be about since the time is ticking down. We still have a few weeks, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the right track. Uh, it is required uh, in order to pass the class to, to have some attempt on the final paper, uh, regardless of your initial score. Um, and also we're going to post uh, this uh, the problem set very, very soon, uh, which is basically like, um, so there are two problems on the problem set. One of them is very simple, like estimating uh, how many uh, uh, qubits are equivalent to a, like a number of classical bits. So you'll figure out how many qubits you need to like store, like store the entire internet or something. Um, and, and you'll also, um, and we'll also have you uh, play with IBM's quantum computers. And we hope that that's a, relatively rewarding. So if there are no other questions, um, uh, I'm going to uh, sign off. But if you have any questions, feel very free to email us. Uh, and we'll be very happy to answer those. In addition um, to it being Nicholas's birthday, I think some other congratulations are in order. OK, hold on um, a second. Nicholas, wait, just wait a second. Uh, wait a second. And I'm going to uh, do a thing.